to the first episode of the Essentially Translatable podcast brought to you by Lutheran Bible Translators. My name is Rich Rudowski. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at LBT and your host for the podcast. The current coronavirus situation is the context in which this podcast was conceived and birthed, and I'd like to give a hat tip to my good friend, Dr. Tilahun Mendido, who pushed us here at LBT to look for ways to connect with folks while our more routine in-person and print methods are not available or reduced. Thanks also to the whole production team who has put this thing together and is giving your time and energy to this effort, particularly Amy Gertz, Rob Veit, Andy Olson, and Caleb Rodewald. The podcast name, Essentially Translatable, is kind of a wordplay on the idea that we want to dig into some of the interesting points of Bible translation. Yes, Bible translation and all the associated types of work that go into that type of ministry. But we also want to talk about overseas living, the theology of mission, the growth of the global Christian church, and the Lutheran expression of that church. And we want to do that in a way that's accessible for you, our listener. That is, we want it to be relatable. We want to translate it for you. It's essentially translatable. And because it's all essentially translatable, that's what we want to do in this podcast is is just let you into our world and, and share ideas and thoughts. In addition, in this season where the term essential worker is in full use, we want to mark this season as the beginning of this podcast with the use of that word essential and with our heartfelt thanks to anyone out there who is an essential worker in these difficult times. We pray for your protection, strength, and safety, and moreover, that God would be glorified in your words and actions in this season. This podcast is dedicated to you. Our guest today is Dr. Mike Rodewald, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of Lutheran Bible Translators. He has served in that post since 2014, serving previously as LBT Associate Missionary and Regional Director for Africa with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod World Mission from 2007 to 2014, and then as a Lutheran Bible Translators missionary to Liberia and Botswana with his family from 1979 to 2007. Mike has a master's in applied linguistics from the University of Texas at Arlington and a PhD in missiology from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Mike. Hey, nice to be here, Rich. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, glad to, and it's really exciting to start off this uh, this podcast, and we're excited to learn more about you and the, the vision that you have for Bible Translation Ministry and LBT. Tell us about how you got started in mission, what you were doing before, and how God led you to serve with LBT. Well, I was, actually, I was uh, teaching high school band back in the day, and I loved teaching the students. It was a lot of fun, but I realized that uh, public education was probably something that I did not want to continue on on. In. And what's been uh, uh, interesting is recently I've connected with some of my former students and uh, uh, via Facebook, and that's brought back a lot of the memories of those days uh, teaching high school band and teaching music and public education. Yeah. During that time, I was really I was visiting my my parents. My father was pastor, and uh, they had a movie set up in the gym on one of these big uh, reel to reels. And uh, my father suggested, why don't you watch that movie over there? You won't be here uh, uh, when we're going to show this. But uh, And I did. It was called From Mojave Sands. And uh, at the end of it, it was a Lutheran Bible translator a movie back in the day. And uh, there was a fellow on there that said, come and help us. And, you know, that those words right there, it piqued my interest. And I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. I wonder if I could do something like that. And I took a course uh, in linguistics, and I found, oh, this is intriguing. And that's how it started. Then one day, several days, years later, I found myself on a plane going to Africa, still wondering kind of how did this all happen, but it's been a <laughs> real joy uh, to see. Maybe that's how everybody is when they start in mission is, wow, how did I get here? But uh, it's been a real joy. Yeah, that's great. So uh, a long time in missionary service, and what are some of the ways that you saw and have seen the Lord working while you're in missionary service? For me, it's been a, a real privilege to serve in missions. My family and I served 33 years in different countries in Africa. It's really a big world, and uh, each culture has its own perspective on life and how it's going. We call that worldview. And when one learns another culture through experience, and one learns to question one's own culture and worldview, uh, it just opened my mind. It just was a, a series of aha moments. I saw working in mission and learning about other people and how God is for all people as being one of the most exciting things that happened to me in missionary service. 
that's really the point. As CEO of Lutheran Bible Translators, God's word is for everybody. And the end result is always faith through the Holy Spirit. But how people react to the word or understand it can be different. One of the highlights uh, I thought about when you asked me about this podcast was it just happened just uh, fairly recently. But when I was in Liberia in the 80s, I was working in a language group called Bondi, and we uh, did a translation of Genesis, just the one book of, out of the Old Testament. And uh, at one literacy class back in the 80s, late 80s, we made those copies available. And this was in a predominantly Muslim area. And I remember one man coming up to us after reading that and saying, wow, this, th- these stories are really great in here. They're different from the ones we've learned. But if you have more of this, we'd really like that. Wow. And uh, uh, last year, uh, we were making a survey again in that area to see about the need for uh, translating the whole New Testament in that area and redoing the New Testament, which has been done for many years. And someone came up to the people who were doing the survey, and they had a tattered, broken copy of this Genesis. And this old man who had it, he said, we need more of this. We need more of this. And he had kept it all those almost 35 years. He's been and it's tattered and some pages are missing and everything else. But for him, God's word, it's just very precious to have that. And that that was a highlight. I just um, felt really happy to see how God is using that text over 35 years to keep this man engaged. That's fantastic. So tell us some about your pathway from missionary service to becoming the CEO of Lutheran Bible Translators. My wife, as I was studying for linguistics, we went back to Liberia, but there was a civil war was going on and it was hard to get back to the uh, language area. It just was not possible at that time, too dangerous. When we, uh, the war broke out fully, then uh, we went to Botswana and we worked in Botswana for a number of years uh, before becoming uh, regional director for Uh, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Africa. That was in 2008. That was really a joy to to get out and discover as I served as regional director. I made relationships all over the continent. When I think about meeting some of those leaders uh, so many years ago, none of us realized at the time that it would lead to a partnership for Bible translation. Now that I've been called as CEO of Lutheran Bible Translators for the last six years, uh, the experiences and relationships built through those years, they continue to build in God's mission that people might know Jesus. The Makani Jesus Church in Ethiopia is the largest Lutheran church in the world with over 10 million. Their leader's vision for Bible translation into the future makes really, it makes for a great partnership. And it's awesome to see God's hand at work. And I just get kind of awed to see uh, how God has used all of this and all this experience and all the relationships to be inside God's story of salvation like this for this time. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's, it's really amazing how the, the, the importance of relationships as, um, as you go along. And so that, that really testifies to the importance of long-term service or how God has used that and brought people back together in ways that you wouldn't have guessed. It just kind of circles back around. God's always at work in, in his mission, which kind of leads to uh, uh, missiology. You have a Ph.D. in missiology. Um, and you've talked a lot to the organization about the importance of that, but maybe for our listeners, um, what is missiology? Why is that important in, in our work, uh, maybe for the church in general and for, for Lutheran Bible translators? Overseas, I learned a lot of experiences, but uh, it, uh, missiology has allowed me to hone them and put them all in a framework that I can uh, actually use and uh, that they make sense. So missiology really is, it's the study or science of mission. Uh, it, missiology has theology at its center, and uh, it researches culture and the ways of the world in order to reduce barriers to the gospel. Let me put it that, that way is the, maybe the simplest way of thinking about it. It reduces barriers to what God is doing in the world through his word. So I've always approached missiology more as telling me uh, what not to do rather than telling me what to do. The gospel is everything it really needs to be, and we set up barriers to the gospel by our human actions. We are imperfect people, and uh, so we mean well, but we don't always do well because our actions are not perceived as we thought they should have been. Uh, There's a missiological question. Uh, If we proclaim the gospel and no one hears, have we really proclaimed the gospel? So it's similar to translation principles. If you follow good translation principles, you will get good output. If you follow good missiological principle, you won't make as many mistakes and set up problems that later have to be overcome. 
And through my experience in Africa and uh, traveling around to different Lutheran churches and traveling around to different partners, it's one of the biggest uh, uh, problems that I've seen is uh, mission people, as we serve in mission, especially in Western mission, we mean well, uh, but we don't always act in ways that are perceived as we intended them to be uh, in, uh, per- perceived. And then that sets up barriers to the very things that we're trying to do. Yeah, so then um, that missiological perspective you bring into a leadership role as CEO, how, how does that um, impact your, your role or help you in your role as the LBT's executive director? Well, for me, uh, missiology points us straight to the story of salvation through Jesus as uh, God's mission to all people. And really, that's our purpose in Bible translation ministries, whether it's as a translation advisor, as a scripture engagement resource, or uh, teaching missionary kids, whatever we're serving, whatever mission purpose we are in. There's no other pro- purpose except to point people to God's story of salvation. We uh, seek excellent output in translation and what we do, not because we are proudly professional in our mission efforts, but because we really want to be excellent as we serve in God's mission. That's awesome. And you've been you've been doing this for a while now, um, both, uh, you know, already five and a half years as CEO, but then you're, you're overall uh, experience and is it 30 how many years in Africa 33 yeah with long time, like 33 years so yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah. What, what changes have you experienced in Bible translation ministry or missionary service in general over your career yeah that's I, I, I that one I could talk for the next 30 minutes uh, straight on it but I won't uh, but just briefly, uh, translation used to occur on typewriters, used to occur by hand. Uh, typewriters, which you made a mistake, and then you started the page over again. Then we had uh, kind of faulty computers, which always seemed to lose uh, all the data that you had done for the last week, or maybe as user error as we got used to it. Uh, we had text disappear, everything. And so the, the process was slowly getting faster, but it was still fraught with errors. But uh, getting to that end product, uh, distribution, printing, getting that Bible printed and getting it uh, distributed was a long and arduous uh, process. And uh, it really depended upon a missionary advisor. Missionaries were in charge of the project, and uh, they were the ones who had the technical ability to be able to do that. Well, technology has improved, and that has really accelerated our processes. And uh, one thing I've noticed is education in the communities in which we work has improved radically uh, from those days so many years ago, 30 years ago, where uh, now in marginalized communities in the churches that we work, there are people with PhDs, uh, masters. uh, And so uh, the ability to do things with our implementing partners uh, is much more full than it was uh, years ago. So increasingly, our role has turned into an advising and support role uh, rather than an implementing role, as our partners are actually doing the implementing, and we're advising and making sure that the quality is maintained. We're also moving towards self-sustainability within the church and language community. Uh, That is a, a real goal of ours, is how much can the local language community contribute towards this effort? Uh, that creates ownership by the community. So when a, lang- when a community is really ready for translation, it's possible we can move much faster and with better quality than we ever did in the past. Uh, the bad side of that, there's always a flip side, is it's easier for those with little or no translation principle knowledge to uh, do a bad translation really quickly that does not produce quality output. That's a new and ongoing challenge that we're seeing sometimes. And it's not particularly our problem, but it attracts resources uh, which could be targeted for actually bringing God's word into the community. And it also points people in the wrong direction when they read a bad translation and they're pointed in, uh, not to, to Christ, but they're pointed away from Christ through that bad translation. So uh, it's a it's a concern. Talk technology has helped us a lot, um, really um, uh, accelerating what we're doing and making better quality possible. It's also done just the opposite, too. So. Yeah, it's never as simple as you hope it will be, is it? Uh, that we had a quote on our social media recently from Andrew Walls, who says uh, something to the effect of considering all the complexity in translation, it's amazing that that's the way God, in his wisdom, chose to to reach people uh, through the, the spread of the word and, and the heart language. Out of um, wisdom. Yes, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to be laughing on that, but it's <laughs> It's true. Yeah. 
So, uh, so you became uh, uh, executive director of LBT in 2014, and then one of the first things that uh, your new administration did at that point was to move the headquarters to the next year in 2015. So, kind of, why did you start there? What was the, the the need for that, or the importance of that, and how has has that played into LBT's strategic vision uh, at that time and moving forward? Well, at that time we had a big building in the uh, uh, Chicago area and uh, it needed about a half a million dollars of deferred maintenance. Uh, and I do have to say in the first days of LBT, when we were first in the Chicago area, uh, Lutheran Bible Translators, history of Lutheran Bible Translators started in California, then in 1984 moved to Chicago. Um, and uh, we had a large building uh, there, it was about 15,000 square feet. And we needed a large staff and we needed a large building to support our missionaries uh, overseas. The, everything was done manually and uh, we had to ship barrels. We, had to, uh, we needed space for shipping out everything else. But as time and technology has come in, uh, the need for the large building did no longer uh, was there. I personally, I think the day of the big building for nonprofits is um, a, a leftover. And uh, for us as Lutheran Bible translators, it detracted from spending for our overseas programs. So we, um, we sold it and we moved the organization to a more cost-effective uh, location. So we're right here in Concordia, Missouri right now. The first year we moved, we could reallocate $400,000 for ministry rather than maintenance costs and uh, uh, the other things that we would have had to, to, we would expect to have paid if we would have maintained that building. So as CEO, that makes me very happy uh, to take $400,000 out of maintenance and put it to, uh, to ministry. And we have a great partnership with St. Paul Lutheran High School here in Concordia, and they lease a space right now. We do everything through technology. Uh, we don't need the big offices. We don't need uh, a big space. Uh, rather, we have a lot of shared space here on the campus. The campus used to be a two-year uh, Lutheran university, and uh, so they had space, and they said, we can use this. We'll just share this space and give us a really nice lease. We also have really very committed staff from the commuter, uh, from the community, and they feel privileged to be serving in God's mission right here in Concordia, Missouri. Who would have ever thought? So just awesome to be here right now. Yeah, that's that's great. So now when we're, we're here in 2020, what's strategic for you like right now as we look in, in 2020? We've kind of come to this point and there's, uh, there's staff, there's the, the missionary and the partners. And what's the what's the key kind of moving forward from your perspective? Well, short term, COVID-19 is, uh, I think everybody is scrambling to say, what does this mean to us? And what is our new strategy? Well, how do we uh, uh, how do we continue to implement as maybe methods are changing and uh, the, our context is changing? Uh, but one of the, the main things which does not change is, uh, is helping our partners to be more self-sustaining in uh, the vision of Bible translation. We can kind of look at the research previous to the COVID-19, and we can see that the capacity of Lutheran churches here in the United States is not growing. Rather, it's really in decline. So the way of the past, depending upon Western support to accomplish Bible translation ministry, uh, is not going to be the future someday along the line, whether it's tomorrow or whether that's 10 years in the future. But there's tremendous capacity in emerging Lutheran churches throughout the world. This does not mean that we will not continue to play a role it's just that the capacity is emerging and it's growing in our Lutheran partners throughout the world through Bible societies throughout the world. They're willing and able to partner in mission to reach marginalized uh, language communities with the gospel in their own languages. And so training, skill building, self-sustainability accelerates what we are already doing. The experience uh, being gained by our current missionaries creates leaders uh, to help emerging Lutheran church bodies and local Bible societies to put God's word in the hands of those who need it. So uh, uh, we're moving to the new paradigm. Uh, there's, there's a whole new paradigm, which is emerging. And um, as these churches become stronger and stronger, um, we praise God that uh, we're working with them, that the vision of Bible translation will continue and God's word will continue to go forth uh, no matter what the future brings. 
That's great. So um, Luther Bible Translators is part of a collective impact alliance called Illuminations, which has uh, been in the media from time to time and, and uh, has some, some interesting things going on. But for our listeners, what is a collective impact alliance and who is involved in that? Why is that beneficial for Lutheran Bible translators and, and for Bible translation work in general? Yeah, uh, a collective impact occurs when a group of agencies or a group of people agree to cooperate for a mutual goal. It doesn't really mean that uh, each is only concentrated on that one goal. It maybe each does a variety of things, but they agree to concentrate on one specific goal in addition to the other goals that you may have as your own agency or your own personnel. So um, we serve in this Illuminations Impact Alliance with nine other Bible translation agencies. And uh, each of the agencies does a variety of things. Uh, but we agree to come to work together to cooperate on this common goal of getting God's word in people's hands, reaching those who do not have God's word in uh, their own languages. So there are different motivations. There's different area of operations, but we're serving in a collective impact alliance, helps focus how and where the need for Bible translation exists. And it also helps us to build new tools and new strategies for reaching people groups. Not every place that we go can others go, and uh, we can go to other places, especially through our Lutheran connections overseas, uh, where other agencies cannot go. So Illumination Resource Partners, then they support this whole movement uh, towards Bible translation, and uh, each individual agency also continues to support itself for things that are not in that mutual impact goal. So in the end, we can do more for Bible translation and through Bible translation through a uh, collective impact alliance than we can if each of us are working individually. So with uh, all the opportunities that folks have to be in missions, so a lot of our listeners probably um, it, when they are at church or um, even just through their own mailbox or email box in these days, will receive lots of lots of offers to be involved in making a difference in the world or being involved in mission. Why should someone consider getting involved in Bible translation ministry as the mission where they would put their focus, their limited resources, and so on. I'm going to sound uh, probably a little bit biased, and somebody will say, well, sure, Rodewald, you're CEO of a Lutheran, of Lutheran Bible Translator, so you're going to say this. But in my 33 years in Africa, I've seen a lot of good things happen in mission, and I've really noted that people are well-intentioned as they serve, even if they uh, don't have a suitable missiological basis for their actions. God's word in one's own language is uh, it's incomparable. Just as Jesus comes to us in a way that we can understand, the word in one's own language comes without a barrier. There's really nothing we must do. There's no other language we must learn in order to know of God's salvation through Jesus. So Bible translation is the story of salvation moving throughout the world to the very end of the earth. Generations are affected, and Bible translation, it changes the world. And uh, that's why I am so uh, passionate about Bible translation, the ministries of Lutheran Bible translators, and what we're doing, because uh, that's the way that Jesus is known throughout the whole world. So what, what keeps you motivated to, to stay in ministry and mission, and, and uh, what brings you joy in this work? Uh, I get a joy in that as we serve in, through Bible translation that people know Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no other purpose for me. Uh, that people know Jesus Christ, because that changes the world. And when people know Jesus Christ, then uh, I'll get to see those people in heaven. And um, I'll get to talk about my part in the story of God's salvation. And they'll talk about their part, and we'll see everyone all together. That that gives me great joy. No other purpose. And so, yeah, in, in today's world, the 21st century um, changes in our society, um, and, and the role and the influence of the church here. Um, what advice do you have for anybody listening who may be considering ministry service of some kind or missionary service? Well, as God calls people to serve, I think there's two necessities. Uh, there's some sort of missiological training, missiological training and awareness. It doesn't have to be called missiological training, but one has to be aware of uh, when you're working in a different culture, uh, how things are different. How do people's worldview is different? When one has to understand that we're serving in God's mission, and if, we, if we're doing it because it makes us feel good, if we have a, a motivation that says, well, maybe I can bring back, um, uh, bring salvation to people, yes, 
that's true, but really we're serving in God's mission. This is God's purpose. This is what God's doing in the world, and he's using us. And then you got to have some experience. I think those are uh, missiological training and experience are really two hard-earned necessities. Experience doesn't come without making mistakes. So this really doesn't mean you should not share Christ with your neighbor. It just means if you're involved in carrying the gospel to those in a different culture, you really need to learn to uh, lower barriers to what you're trying to do, that people perceive Christ in your actions. Otherwise, you're guilty of being perceived differently than you intended, and you set up those barriers. I remember when I was in my first term as a missionary, I was learning language and culture in that village. And um, the local people, they kept asking me questions. Why are you really coming here? Are you here to find gold? Are you here to be rich? Are you here to find a wife? Or whatever it happened to be. They could not perceive that I was there to bring the gospel. That was outside of their paradigm. And uh, I had a car. I had a motorbike. I was the rich guy. And um, so they did not see my actions, everything that I was doing, as congruent with the gospel. And it took years for them to actually understand, oh, yes, okay, now we understand exactly why you came. You came to, to, to bring the gospel to us. So it takes patience, takes experience, takes making mistakes, and it takes missiological acumen uh, gained. Even if you don't call it missiological acumen, somehow those lessons have to be learned in that. If you're interested in mission service with uh, Lutheran Bible translators, uh, we make sure that you're trained in all those skills you need. And uh, we shepherd you through as you make your mistakes and uh, you gain your experience. Uh, we need valuable mission leaders uh, for the future and not just mission doers, but we need the leaders who are going to serve with our partners that God's word might go forth to the very ends of the earth. All right, thanks. Any other thoughts you'd like to share with uh, the audience listening today? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be on this podcast, Rich. Thanks so much for making it possible. And uh, for me, it's a real privilege uh, to serve as CEO of Lutheran Bible Translators. I love seeing how God is using us to reach others, that they might also be in this story of God's salvation through Jesus. And uh, we all serve together as uh, uh, those who support, who give their gifts, those who serve overseas, those who are implementing partners. Uh, God weaves this wonderful story and puts us in it and uses all that other people might know Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's no other purpose and except that others know who Jesus is. And that changes the world. And for me, that's really fun to be a part of. All right. Thanks a lot. We've been talking with Dr. Mike Rodewald, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of Lutheran Bible Translators. Thanks a lot for being with us today, Mike. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to Dr. Mike Rodewald for joining us on the podcast. As I reflect on what we heard from him today, what stands out most is what I think has to be a core in all mission thought and action. If the gospel is proclaimed, but it's not understood, has the gospel been proclaimed? That's a question that challenges us, that needs to drive how we plan, how we act, and for all of us, how we just be wherever God has called us. Thanks for listening to the Essentially Translatable podcast, brought to you by Lutheran Bible Translators. Look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or go to www.lbt.org to find out how you can get involved in the Bible translation movement and help put God's Word in their hands.